All right, welcome. We're going to be doing vehicle extrication today. This first part of the class is just an overview of the simple stuff for approaching a vehicle, extricating a patient, what to look for, safety, and techniques we're going to do. From this class, once this is over, we're going to go outside. We have a vehicle that we're going to cut apart. We're going to show you what we want to see when you approach and the actions you want to take to help get a patient safely from the vehicle. That's going to be extrication 101. This is for the people that have had very little experience or no experience, and it's just trying to get everybody on the same playing field so everyone approaches the vehicle safely. Um, in the overview, we're going to go over the extrication philosophies. We're going to go over the scene approach and vehicle identification. We're also going to hit on the passive and aggressive systems. I'm oh, sorry, passive and active systems. Um, safety system mitigations, how to disable them and what you're looking for, and then extrication considerations. So let's begin with extrication philosophies. First, you need to be aware of your surroundings and when you approach a scene, you need to have a 360 degree view of what's going on. So you gotta identify hazards that are associated with the accident, hazards that are associated around the accidents, and then you also have to take care of your people, the bystanders, and obviously the patient. So, most importantly is always going to be safety. It's got to be safety of yourself, safety of your crew, and safety of the patients. That entails a lot of different aspects of the scene, but we're going to start with real basics, which is make sure all your people have their protective gear on, which is full turnouts, helmet, eye pro, and gloves. If you're going to be using extrication tools, you should have a charged hose line out on the ground, because while you're using the tools, if something sparks and happens to catch fire from leaking fluid, you want to make sure you have the protection in place for your guys and for the patient. So patient protection. It's important to access the patient early and assess them, but you don't want to commit to a patient too early before you're done triaging the rest of the scene. You need to know how many patients you have and you need to know the extent of their injuries. So once you've completed a triage and you've let command know how many people you have, then you can commit yourself to one patient and start assessing the situation from there. On scene, it's a common practice for the first responders to arrive, go directly to the vehicle, find the first patient they see, and get stuck there. It's really important not to limit your resources by stopping too early in the triage scene. So on arrival, send at least one person to go find out the number of patients you have and the extent of the injuries before you commit people because you're probably going to need to call for more resources and you don't want to get stuck with too few people and too many patients. Along with patient triage, you also need to assign somebody to triage the scene and essentially that just means identifying the hazards that are going to be associated with the accident, whether that's fluids on the ground, fire, smoke from, a, from the airbags, um, above hazards like power lines, whether they're down or not, or they're going to interfere. So along with patient triage, you need someone to triage the scene and make sure all the safety considerations are taken care of on the vehicle side of the situation. All right, so now that we've assessed the patient, made access, and assessed the scenes and the hazards associated with that, the next step is trying to figure out how to remove the patient from the vehicle. The trick to this and what's often forgot is we're not actually pulling the patient out of the vehicle, we're trying to remove the vehicle from around the patient so we move the patient as little as possible preventing any further injury. All right, continuing on with extrication philosophy, one good rule of thumb is less is more and what I mean by that is the less time you spend on scene, the more beneficial it is going to be for the patient. The average extrication time takes 30 minutes. And generally, what does a trauma entry patient need? It's gonna be surgery. So the quicker we can get the patient out of the car, the quicker we can get them on the road and into the, into the emergency room. Now we all know that faster is better, especially when it comes to taking care of a patient. But nowadays, with the way vehicles are being made, the safety systems, the use of special metals and alloys, it's gonna be a lot more difficult for us to make quick access to a patient safely. So what we need to do is mitigate that time by becoming more efficient at what we're doing. So as I stated before, it's always best to remove the, the vehicle from around the patient, but sometimes in immediate life danger, 
you're gonna have to kind of throw those rules out the window and just get the person out as quick as you can and then treat them afterwards. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're approaching a scene and you're doing your triage, how extensive are their injuries and how quickly do they actually need to be out and transported. All right, next is gonna be scene approach and control. So on arrival of the scene, you need to identify the hazards and you need to know how many resources you have coming and what's available to you. Because anytime you perform an extrication on a vehicle, you're gonna need a, at least another unit or anytime you're gonna have at least one C-spine patient, you're gonna need another, another unit. So on approach to the scene, know which direction you're coming from, know which direction your other apparatus are coming from, and use your apparatus to block the scene to keep your crew safe and the patient safe. That means taking up multiple lanes and preventing any other vehicles from driving through your scene while you have your guys operating. All right, stabilization. First, we need to stabilize the scene then we need to stabilize the vehicles, and then follow with that, we need to stabilize the patients. To stabilize the scene, we need to limit traffic control and bystanders entry into the scene. For the vehicles, we need to remove the keys from the vehicle, place the vehicle in gear, possibly chalk the vehicle or pop the tires to prevent the vehicle from moving. And after that's secure, we need to make a quick access to the patient as we can so we can hopefully secure them and work on our extrication techniques. So there is a priority order, priority order to stabilizing the scene. We try to stabilize the actual vehicles first prior to a patient. That it can be really simple as far as just removing the keys and make sure the power's off to the vehicle and then going to the patient. But anytime you have an unstable vehicle, you don't want to make access to the victim until you get the vehicle stabilized so your people can safely enter. So next for extrication on the scene, you need to come up with a plan A, B, and C. In order to start that process, you need to assign a dedicated extrication team leader, have them create your plan A, and assign that to your extrication team. Once they start working on that plan A, the extr extrication team leader needs to start working on a plan B and C. There's no reason to overcommit to plan A if it's not working, and then move on to plan B, and then so on to plan C. Don't get tunnel vision by getting stuck into one plan because you think you almost have the extrication. If you need to move on and it's gonna be a quicker, safer route, then move on to plan B. So what happens more and more on these uh, vehicle crashes it was, is we get our bread, and butter, our bread and butter calls, which is a T-bone or a head-on accident, which is gonna require us just to have to pop a door to get somebody out. Well, the problem with that is those are so simple that we forget to get in the habit of creating a plan B and a plan C. So if you get in the mindset of always creating at least three plans for any extrication, when you get the really difficult extrications and the rollovers, it'll be a lot easier to transition for you to scrap one plan and move on to your next. So now we're gonna go over vehicle construction. We're gonna go over body reinforcements, body configuration, and last, the exotic metals that are used. We're not gonna hit on that one too much. You just have to be aware that newer vehicles are now using more and more exotic metals, which are much harder for us to cut, especially if we're operating with older tools. All right, now we're gonna get into body configurations. So there's three main styles. We're gonna have the full frame, we're gonna have the unibody, and we're gonna have the space frame. So full frame vehicles are vehicles that get their structural sound from one component, which is the frame. They're usually the older heavy steel cars that rely on the two metal frames running from front to back on the vehicle. Now unibody frames are frames that were designed and usually started using in the, in the 1960s. They started incorporating subframes and the floor pans for extra reinforcement into the vehicles. And now the space frame is a newer, more modern type of frame that we see on a lot of the cars nowadays, which is deriving strength from the floor pans, the subframes, and the actual frame around the entire body. Most of the newer vehicles are using that kind of technology where you have multiple layers of metal throughout the frame of the vehicle, creating more support and more safety for the passengers. So it's it's important to identify which type of frame you're, you're gonna be extricating on, mainly because you need to know the materials you're gonna be working with and what type of tools you have at your, disposal, at your disposal. Older steel bodies are gonna have 
a good frame and the soft skin of it is still going to be steel, so you have a little bit to work off of, as opposed to newer vehicles, which is less steel on the outside, but a lot more reinforcement on the inside you can't see. Newer tools will be able to cut through that stuff a lot easier. Some of the older models of cutters and spreaders may have a more difficult time getting through new material. All right, next with the vehicle frames, we're going to go over the reinforcements inside the vehicles. We're going to go over soft points versus hard points. We're going to go over door hinges, and we're going to go over door beams, which are a newer safety component that you're going to start seeing more and more. So next we're going to go over soft points and hard points of the vehicle. Soft points is the outer skin of the vehicle. They tend to stress very easily in a crash and they tend to stress really easy uh, when we're using our extrication tools. Hard points are points on the vehicle that are connected to the soft skin and also connected to reinforcements. The hard points are the points that we're going to have to force in order to gain access to our victims. All right, we're going to go over the hinge and latch points of the vehicle. They're hard and reinforced points of the vehicle that we're going to have to force. They're usually hardened steel, forged, cast, stamped. In order to make access to a vehicle using a, a hatch or a hinge, you're going to either have to cut and or spread the hinge or latch away from the vehicle to open the door. So for the latches, you have a nader pin, a safety bolt, or there's a wedge style, which you can see on older, old, older cars and trucks. Um, there's also some European styles out there that you'll see nowadays on newer vehicles, such as the Jaguars and the BMWs. They're all still reinforced. They can still be popped and opened with our conventional techniques. You just have to understand that it may take a little more time if you're not pushing on the hard points and you're only working against the soft points. So once you've made your purchase point to the door and you can see what type of latch you're working against, you can then identify whether you're going to need to spread the door open or if you can cut it. A nader pin or a safety bolt, depending on the type of equipment you're using, could be cut. A wedge style or some of the newer European styles may need to be spread in order to unlatch them from the body. And last in our passive systems is going to be the door beams. These are high strength steel beams or micro alloy boron beams, which are very difficult for us to, to cut. Um, they're welded to lighter connections inside the vehicle, so in an accident, it's possible for them to become disconnected from the vehicle and actually pushed into a post, creating a deadbolt type of situation on a, on a vehicle door. So for us to pop the door is going to be much more difficult. So you may understand that you're running into problems with the door beams. On approach to the vehicle, if you see it's a T-bone accident or even a really significant head-on accident, when you start to extricate the patient and you run into problems, on the lower end of the door, it seems like it's dead bolted shut, then you're possibly dealing with the door beam and you may have to pull away the skin of the vehicle so you can properly identify what you're dealing with. And as you can see in this slide here, um, once the door skin has been peeled off, you can see the, the door beam running from the A post back to the B post of the front door and from the B post back to the C post of the rear door. All right, now we're going to move on to the active safety systems, which is going to be the airbags, the, pre, uh, the seat belt pretensioners, and rollover protection. All right, so we're going to go over airbags. Vehicle sensors in the vehicle, when they're impacted, set off the airbag. It takes multiple sensors to activate the airbag. Some of the safety points for this is there's nitrogen gas that's used to inflate the airbags. The nitrogen gas is an inert gas and it presents no significant health hazards to the victims or to us. Um, they're packed with a powder sil similar to baby powder or talcum powder, but that's, it's not what it is. It just, it's in there to prevent everything from sticking to itself on inflation. It's often mistaken as a puff of smoke um, or that it's starting a fire, but it's a non-toxic chemical. The airbag igniters um, can be hot enough to occasionally start a fire, so after an airbag's been activated and you see the puff of smoke, chances are that's just the powder, but you need to cut the airbag away just to prevent the material from being in there from being ignited due to the, uh, the small explosion activating the airbag. All right, as you can see in the slide, you see a chemical called sodium azide. This is, uh, this is the component. It burns at a rapid rate and it expels the nitrogen gas to inflate the airbag. 
that's the powder you see. This is a non-toxic powder. All right, so now airbag identifiers. Almost all vehicles have some type of airbag identifier. The problem is there's no standard. There's no manufacturer standard. There's no government standard. So the identification stamps in the vehicle can be kind of whatever the manufacturer wants them to be. So you have to look in multiple places. You have to look for multiple ID tags and some of them are hidden. So you'll find things that say airbag. You'll find things that say SRS, which is safety restraint system. You can find them on, on the, the horn cover. You can find them on the sides of the actual seats because some vehicles have airbags in the seats. You can find them under the steering column um, for knee protection. So whenever you're working in and around a vehicle, even if you've cut the power, you need to still identify where your airbag, airbag systems are so everyone working with you is aware of the hazard. Because of the hazards associated with airbags and them activating on the people in the vehicles, whether it's us or the victims, you need to know where they are. And even if the power has been cut, the systems have still been known to have a charge anywhere from 10 seconds to a few minutes. So it's still a possibility that the airbags can activate after the batteries have been cut. So when dealing with a vehicle that's been in an accident and the airbags have not been deployed, ensure you cut the power to the vehicle as soon as you can. And when you're assessing the patient and working with inside the vehicle, make sure you keep your hands and heads away from the airbag and never place your head or any body part between the victim and the airbag if they, if they haven't been deployed. And last thing on the airbags that I want to touch on really quickly is there's now a standard out there for dual activation airbags. So once you're in an accident and your airbag is activated, there's still a possibility of a second charge being in the airbag due to secondary collisions. So even if you have an airbag activated in a vehicle from the steering wheel or the passenger's front dash, there's still a possibility for a second one to be in there so make sure you cut the power and be diligent about staying out of the way of it. All right, second part of the active systems are the seat belt pretensioners. Now these work in line with the airbags. So like I said, the seat belt pretensioners work in conjunction with the airbags. Once the airbag sensor is hit and the airbags activated, there's a little pyrotechnic action down in the seat belt pretensioner, which activates the seat belt so it retracts you back into the seat so when you impact the airbag, it's not as hard. So seatbelt pretensioners are usually found in the B post of the vehicle. They can be at shoulder height or they can be down at the bottom. So it's important when you go to extricate a vehicle that's been in an accident, chances are the pretensioner has activated, but just in case it hasn't, you don't, you don't wanna cut into it. So as we're gonna go over later, it's always important before you cut into a vehicle is you need to peel and peek, which means you need to get inside the vehicle, pull all the plastics away so you can see what you're looking at and what you're about to cut. So you make sure you don't cut the inappropriate parts of the vehicle. All right, it's important to, to note this because just because it's activated or, or especially if it hasn't activated, there's a pyrotechnic propellant to these systems. And if you cut into it, you can rupture the system which will cause damage to you or the passenger. So always make sure you look before you cut so you don't hit any of these systems. And last in our active systems, we are gonna go over rollover protection. Also identified in the vehicles as ROPS, which is rollover protection systems. These are usually spring activated or pyrotechnic activated systems that act as a cage for convertible, convertible vehicles if they happen to end up on their sides or on their tops to protect the passengers. As you can see in the picture, the rollover protection systems are roll bars that activate behind the headrest of the vehicles. There are currently a couple designs out there on the market. In the picture, you'll see the two separate ones. In other vehicles, there's one large bar that will ac activate in the same aspect, whether it's a spring or a pyrotechnic. Um, these are activated due to the gyroscope that's in the vehicle. It will activate depending on how far the vehicle leans forward, backwards, or to the side. This is important because if you go to a vehicle that's one rolled over and these didn't activate, 
you need to be concerned about them activating on you. Or two, if you have a vehicle that's kind of tilted at an angle, for whatever reason, if it's stuck on something, a tree stump or a guardrail, and these haven't activated, there's still potential for them activating. And if you're inside the vehicle holding C-spine on a patient or just assessing the situation, you don't want to be around when these activate. So again, a way to protect yourself, cut the power to vehicles and stay clear of them as best you can. So keep your heads and your hands away from them. One more aspect of the rollover protection system on convertibles is the windshield. It's now reinforced with a boron steel that runs up the windshield A post and around the top of the windshield. So it acts like a roll cage for the front of the vehicle. So if a vehicle happens to roll and the rear ROPS system activates, the front windshield's already in play, hopefully protecting the patients inside the vehicle. All right, so now let's get into cutting the vehicle. Um, prior to cutting any vehicle, it's really important, especially with newer vehicles, that we go over the, the process of peeling and peaking or strip and look. However you want to remember it, it's no big deal. But you do need to get your head in the car and you need to use a tool, whether it's a small crowbar, pair of pliers, or a screwdriver, and you need to start peeling away all the interior plastics of the vehicle because you have to find the nitrogen cylinders for the side airbags, for the side curtains, and for your pretensioners before you cut the vehicle because you need to identify whether you're going to cut above or below the cylinder, never on the cylinder. Um, if, you, if you look it up online, you can see people testing this and actually cutting the cylinders and the cylinder will rupture and it will cause damage to you or possibly the victims. So peel and peek, get the plastics out of there and identify where you need to make your cuts. So in this picture, you can see some of the nitrogen gas cylinders that are hidden behind the post of a vehicle. So you won't see these unless you peel and peek away the plastics. Once you have and you've identified where these are, it's important for you to make a mark on the exterior of the vehicle so the people running the extrication tools know where they need to cut. All right, to recap some of this stuff, we're gonna go over the safety system mitigation. Um, so for the safety systems, first you need to identify and recognize the, the hazards. So that is looking at the vehicle, recognizing what type of vehicle it is, and if there's been a airbag deployment and where other airbags are. You need to cut the power. So that requires opening the hood of the vehicle, cutting the cables to the battery, or just removing them. Keeping in mind nowadays with new cars, not all the batteries are under the hood. Some of them are in the wheel well, some of them are in the trunk. So if you pop a hood and you don't see a battery, start thinking of alternate places for that battery to be because you need to get the power cut. When needed, you gotta cut the seat belts on the patients. It's not necessarily always needed, but when you do need to get a patient out, just cut the seat belt and mitigate the situation with the seat belt pretensioner. Don't just unbuckle it and get it out of the way. Just cut the seat belt and have it one less thing that you need to worry about. And finally, prior to any cutting, peel and peek or strip and look, whatever you do, get all the plastics off, remove them from the vehicle. Don't just pull them out and look to see that the cylinders are there. Yank the plastics out so everyone can see and mark where the cuts need to be. All right, so that's it kind of for the classroom portion of this, of this class. So we're gonna wrap up really quick. Um, what do we wanna remember from all this? Scene safety, so that's the safety of you, safety of your crews, safety of the patients, follow the safety of bystanders and things like that. But it's important to remember, safety first. After that, you need to identify the vehicle, what you're working with, and what the hazards are associated with the vehicle. Create a plan A, B, and C. Even if it's not a big deal of an extrication, just get in the mindset of always creating multiple plans in case the first one doesn't work. Because eventually you're gonna go on something that's big and you may need a second plan, so you might as well be in the mindset of doing it. There are new vehicle changes, which are creating new challenges for us. We need to be more proficient at what we're doing to help stay ahead of the curve. So we need to understand there's high strength metals out there that we're dealing with. We need to understand the safety systems that we're dealing with. And we also need to understand that there's a lot more alternative fueled vehicles out there. So your hybrids, 
your electric vehicles, and your natural gas vehicles. Really quickly on those, there's not a lot of extra hazards to them. I know there's misconceptions about what's going on with the vehicles, but you can attack a hybrid car, an electric vehicle car, the same way you attack a normal gas-powered vehicle. Make sure you cut the power and stay away from the bright orange or bright blue cables they have. There's no reason for us to touch them or play with them. There's chances are they're in a place we will never have to cut or do anything with them. You just have to make sure you get the power off, get the key out, put it in drive, or I mean in park, and um, if it's a remote key that activates in sensories, just get it away from the scene and you will be fine. So like I said, uh, newer cars create new challenges. Um, we have more, uh, more hazards we need to identify and we need to make sure we identify them quickly before we commit to inside of a vehicle because you want to keep everybody safe. Don't mindlessly just cut a vehicle anymore. There's too many hazards, too many concerns that we have with new vehicles. We can't just use the old approach of cut, spread, and pull. We have to come at this smarter and we have to come at it um, more proficiently because the better proficiency we have, the less time we're going to have to spend on the vehicle and the better that's going to be for the patient. When approaching a vehicle, make sure you identify what the hazards are and what type of vehicle you're working on. Crib the wheels in the front and the back. If you don't have step chocks, use standard wood cribbing. Different pieces of cribbing can be used different ways. If you notice the step chocks, I turned upside down to capture the load better. On your walk around, identify the labels on the rear of the car and the front of the car to ensure you're not dealing with a hybrid or electric vehicle and do a quick look inside the vehicle for any type of airbag or safety restraint systems. When beginning your extrication operation, sometimes there are gonna be purchase points available. Other times you'll have to create your own. Easy way to create your own is to use your spreaders on the front quarter panel, pinching the soft metal down or the skin down, opening a, uh, opening a purchase point at the hinges. It's safer to do it this route than using hand tools because it's less vibration on the car, which means less impact on the person. After you get a purchase point in the seam between the door and the front quarter panel, use your spreaders and pull the skin away, exposing the hinges more. The more exposed, the easier it'll be to, to reach the hinges and press apart the door. While spreading, if you notice you're pushing on the skin and tearing away the metal from the car, you're not into a hard point, readjust and continue spreading. It's important to keep the power on the tools throughout, throughout the movement of the tool, as most tools will bog down while you're turning them and use more pressure to continue opening the longer you hold it open. As you can see there, I started pushing on the skin, pulling it away from the door, not having a good purchase point. Another option for removing a hinge from a door is the cutters. The spreaders work well, but the cutters are generally quicker and less impact on the vehicle's movement. Newer hinges are stronger, so be mindful of the tool set you're using. Older tool sets may not be able to cut through newer hinges due to the strength and steel. After the hinge is cut, you can pull the door creating a purchase point in the latch side of the door for easier access to the nader pin. After creating your purchase point in the latch side of the door, you can use your cutters or spreaders to continue forcible entry into the vehicle, keeping in mind the strength of the latch. Prior to cutting any posts in the vehicle, it's important to peel and peek. This requires you to use a tool or your hands and strip away the plastics on the inside of the car looking for the compressed nitrogen cylinders used to activate the airbags, as well as the pretensioner systems for the seat belts. 
After the peel and peak, and prior to cutting any post in the vehicle, it's important you go and remove the glass. Keeping in mind, it's important to have another firefighter in the vehicle with the patient at the time, keeping them covered with a blanket and explaining to them what extrication is going on outside. Remember, it's important to communicate with the patient while they're in the vehicle, keeping them safe, as well as communicating with the exterior team, letting them know the patient's conditions. Prior to cutting the A post of the vehicle, it's important to make a purchase hole in the windshield so you can have an effective cut. A tool such as the irons or a pig-headed axe works well to break a small hole above the, above the side view mirrors of the vehicle in order to get your cutters through. The removal of a roof can be quite easy, but it's important that you've hit all your safety steps before doing it. Make sure you've peeled and peaked and you know the location of your airbag cylinders. It's always safest to cut as low on the post as you possibly can, ensuring that you're below any cylinders. Once you've made a cut, ensure you've kept enough pressure on the tool to completely cut through the plastics on the inside as well as the metal on the outside. Some of these B posts and A posts have multiple layers of metal and can take a significant amount of pressure and time to get cut through. Another viable option besides the spreaders is a sawzall. They will cut through these just as well. Just make sure you have multiple blades if needed. Do not try and control the tool while you're putting pressure on the vehicle. There's a lot of pressure in the hydraulic lines and it will move the tool where it wants to go. Keep yourself in a safe position so you don't get pinched between the tool and the vehicle. If you're in a situation where you can't control the tool, let the pressure off and reset your tool. With the assistance of another firefighter and a long tool, it's easy to lift the roof of the vehicle. Note the seatbelt that's still attached. A common mistake, often missed, needs to be cut prior to lifting.